Welcome into the shop this morning. Thanks for watching, I really do appreciate it. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Um, it's cold out, the furnace is blowing, so sorry if you hear that in the background. I'll try to make sure I talk about it. Today's video, or this video I should say, since it's not just today, um, I think is gonna be one of my most beneficial videos I've done. I am going to re-gear a Dana 60. I have still got my buddy's buggy in here and he wanted me to re-gear both axles from 410s to 538s. Now the rear axle is a 14 volt that has its own video that I will be doing, which also has similarities to like a Ford 9 inch. Um, his front axle in this buggy is a Ford Kingpin Dana 60 with Chevy hours. All the other stuff outside of Dana 60 it really doesn't matter because every manufacturer had their own outers, their own brake systems, their own way of getting the axle shafts out. What I really want to focus is the ring and pinion setup on a Dana 60. Now, the Dana 60 is probably the most popular uh, differential ever built, at least in my opinion. It was used by General Motors, it was used by Ford, it was used by Chrysler, it was used by International. It has a huge marketability when it comes to what it came in. Uh, they, were, they came in the rear axle on a lot of vehicles, they came on the steer axle of a lot of vehicles. Uh, the configuration of the Dana 60 could have been a high pinion, a low pinion, a driver's drop, a passenger drop, a standard rotation, and a reverse rotation gear cut. Um, they were so popular that aftermarket axle housing manufacturers have used the Dana 60 guts, um, the, the center chunk is what I like to call it. Um, Dynatrack uses them, G2 uses them, um, Curry Rock Jock uses Dana 60. Um, who else does? Oh yeah, East Coast Gear uses a Dana 60 new manufactured housing for a Dana 60 center section. Um, outside of the Dana 60, the cool part about the Dana differential is if you understand the process of setting up a ring and pinion in a Dana 60, you can set up just about any of the Dana differentials that were ever manufactured. Now, I will exclude the JLJK with the crush sleeve. Um, that has its own little nuance, but outside of the crush sleeve, if you replace that crush sleeve with a crush sleeve eliminator, after that they set up exactly the same as a, a Dana 60 that I'm going to do today. Now the early Dana differentials like the Dana 21, the Dana 27, the Dana 41, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple of those they set up using the same process as what I'm going to do on this Dana 60. They're early, they're old, they're hard to find parts for these days, but they are still around and a lot of people still try to rebuild them. And if you can find the parts for them, exact same principle, so don't be shy. Uh, getting a little bit late model, um, as you remember the little FC Wrecker of mine, uh, that came with Dana 44s and a lot of Jeeps came with Dana 30s, Dana 44s. Um, other truck manufacturers like Ford, Chevy, Dodge, etc. Especially um, Ford, you know, the Dana 50. Uh, the Dana 70s came in a lot of the trucks, GM, 110 trucks. Uh, Ford used some of them. Uh, Dana 80. The process of any of those axles or differentials is the same as this Dana 60. The difference in the, the 30, the 44, the 50, the 60, the 70, the 80, and I guess I'll throw in the Dana 35, even though it's a C clip and it's the worst differential that Dana ever made. The biggest difference in any of these is just size, bigger and smaller. So if you can set up and understand the process of setting up this Dana 60, you can set up any of those axes. Now, expanding beyond the Dana world of differentials. Uh, the Chrysler eight and a quarter, the Chrysler eight and three quarter, exactly the same as like a Dana 44 or Dana 60 setup. 
The other axle that the process is the same and it always got a bad rap was the AMC Corporate 20. Now the AMC Corporate 20 got a bad rap because the axle tubes would break loose and then the two-piece axle shafts would spin. Now the Corporate 20 came in a lot of Wagoneers, but it came in just about every CJ manufacturer from about 1976 and up. And even though it got a bad rap, if you replaced the axle shaft with single piece axles and welded the axle tubes to the housing or plug welded them so they couldn't spin, that Corporate 20 was stronger than a 44, not quite as strong as a 60. But the key to it was the process I'm going to show on this Dana 60 is the exact same process for setting up a Corporate 20. So you can see there's a huge array of uh, axle differentials that if you understand how to set up a Dana 60 and the principles and process involved, you can set up just about any of these ones I mentioned. And I know there's a handful of them I didn't mention because I'm doing this off the top of my head. <laughs> so. I, I wish I had a magic list I could post and tell you everything that would kind of interchange as far as the process, but um, that I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'm going to get started. I'm going to get the axle shafts out of this thing, and we're going to do a pretty in-depth, but brief, but in-depth uh, ring and pinion setup. The normal, you do have to pull axle shafts, drive shaft, cover, drain the oil, etc., before you can pull the carrier and pinion out. On this axle, I did have to clearance the knuckle so that these uh, chromoly uh, axle joints would slip through. If anyone ever asks what a welded spool is, you can see right here on this open carrier that they have welded it and made it into a spool, commonly known as a Lincoln Locker. This particular axle, I am hoping whoever had this out marked everything accordingly. I've got a horizontal X and I put a horizontal X over here on my housing. I put a vertical X on my housing over here. And I have a vertical X down here on my cap. Bearing caps are off. Then I remove the carrier, remove the pinion yoke, and then the pinion gear. Didn't want to spend a lot of time on the teardown. Once you pull the axles out, bearing caps, get the carrier out, pull the yoke, get the pinion out. We are going from a 410 gear to a 538 gear. So we're increasing a lot of steepness to these gears, far lower. Uh, when you do that, make sure you pay attention to what's called the carrier brake. In this particular application, Dana 60, the carrier brake is 456 and steeper and 410 and uh, shallow gear, meaning 410 and more highway gears, which go clear down to like 273s, things like that. 456 and up would be like 456, 488, 513, 538, 6s or whatever. Now you can use a 410 and down carrier with 456 gears or 538 gears or whatever the case may be if you use thick gears. This particular set of gears is a standard thin set and the new carrier we're putting in is a 456 and up so everything will match. Uh, I gotta see what other parts he supplied with me. Hopefully I've got some bearings and I'll have to pull these off. We're gonna go with the yay on this one. The old stuff, I won't have to remove any of the bearings. I have a complete bearing, shim kit, slinger, everything for the new ring and pinion size and carrier bearings. This way, I don't have to pull any of these bearings off. I'm gonna put the carrier with the ring gear and pinion in a box the way it's shimmed right now and probably eight out of ten if you stuck this into another housing it would probably work just fine uh you may have to change a little bit of the preload shims for the pinion uh maybe some side gears etc for some backlash but but a lot of it's done already. 
One thing I would like to point out, you can see how much smaller the head of this pinion is. Now, when you have a larger pinion head, there's more leverage. On this, there's, there's less leverage. Uh, small heads on a pinion are easier to break. Um, there's just not as many teeth on them. Even though they contact three, there, there's more wear and tear. It's a smaller head. You've got a lot more uh, torque going into the smaller head. So just a little side note there. The other thing I want to point out real quick is, except for the newer version of the 44s like we've done in the shop before, where they have crush sleeves, this Dana 60 is a no crush sleeve spacer preload set on the pinion. So I just want to reiterate that a Dana differential, if it's a 60, a 44, a 30, doesn't really matter if it's a, not a, that one of the new JL, JK deals. They don't use crush sleeves, they use these spacers. So if you understand what's going on on this Dana 60, you can do pretty much any of them. Uh, these are just bigger versions of a 30 and a 44. That's all there is to it. These are serrated lock bolts. Um, I call it optional to use Loctite on them. These do have a drop of Loctite on the threads. Really don't need it, but it's there. So once I get all these started, I flip this over and fight the old torque wrench. Yukon. Uh, One thing I like about them is they have all the specs for all their different wrenches that they sell. With it. I am just using a light impact to draw the ring gear up, then torque wrench. Okay, it's all drawn up. Uh, I know I've gotten comments before and some people do heat the ring gear up. I don't like heating things up. If I heat it up, I'm just gonna heat, use a heat gun. I'm not gonna actually use a torch or nothing. But it's not that cold out, so it's not that cold in my shop. Now for the fun part, torquing. And I recall, Oh yeah, this one isn't as bad. The new JKs and stuff with that new 44 version, those are 130. Uh, this one's only 110. So yeah, a little easier, not a lot. I generally will use one of my rolling vices, chain wrench, kind of get everything clamped and set so it's a little easier to run the torque wrench on. Uh, I may do that off camera. We'll just see how some of these like to rotate, like this one. There we go. Why? Go in two stages. I'll go like, you know, 70, 80 pounds, and then I'll go up to the 110. I like marking the bolts. That way I know if I torque them. This is definitely easier when you're holding kind of the chain wrench and the vise. You've got everything propped up so it keeps the chain in place. Uh, kind of hard holding it all for the camera, but these are torqued, ready to go in. I'm going to grab the set of bearings. 
And I'm gonna have to go over to the press and press this on. I really like oil swingers. They help hold oil up into the bearings for a longer period of time. So these things sat around for a while, obviously got some rust, surface rust on them. I don't want to introduce rust to the bearing surface, so we'll be sanding that off. You can use some emery paper, sandpaper, whatever, but even my setup bearings uh, aren't going to set up well with rust on the I figured I'd better explain setup bearings. This bearing will not go on here without pressing. My shims go between the bearing and the carrier. So once I press those on, then I have to use my bearing removal tools to get that off and change the shims. I've saved a couple of bearings and I took a burr and I just started dremeling the inside of this until it would just barely fit on. There's no play, but it, I can pull it on and off fairly simple. This allows me to swap shims, get the shim packs that I want, then I'm ready to go in. Not quite ready for this yet. First thing, I'm going to install the pinion. I'll throw a few shims in here just for the sake of it and see if it tightens down. I'm not concerned about preload at this point. I'm just gonna snug this down with the inner and outer bearing enough to take up any play and give it, you know, 15, 20 inch pounds of resistance. Then we're gonna put this carrier in and see what our pinion depth is. Now I'm not removing the existing pinion depth shims in the differential housing at this point. I wanna see where my pattern is and then if I need to adjust it from there. But if this differential was set up correctly, chances are I'm pretty close. Uh, setting them up from scratch, you'll have to disassemble three, four times generally. If you've got a shim to work with initially, you know, I can usually take them apart once or twice and, and then I'm dialed into the correct pinion depth. I reiterate pinion depth a lot when I'm doing differentials. If you don't set your pinion depth up right, that is your very first critical measurement. If this is not set up right, it will not work correctly. The gears will make noise, you'll wear out bearings, you'll wear out gears. Um, nothing from this point forward will come out correct unless this starts correct. I'm going to take a couple minutes and talk about pinion depth and pinion preload. Pinion depth is going to be how far in and out the pinion is in comparison to the center line of the ring gear. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what's more pinion depth and less pinion depth because I guarantee you 90% of the people out there that do gears get it backwards already. Um, I'm going to talk about pinion depth as it needs to have a good contact pattern and it will either be too close or too far away from the ring gear. So we've got a pinion, got our slinger, got a bearing pressed on. Now inside the housing is where this race is pressed into. So if there were a housing around it, this would be pressed into that race. Now the shims for pinion depth go between the housing and this inner race. If I need more or less pinion depth, I will either make this thicker or thinner. On a Dana 60, if I need this pinion gear to be closer to the ring gear, I will add shims. If I need it to be further from the ring gear, I will subtract shims. So once I get that set, then I'll worry about my preload. When I'm Getting this set, I really don't care about these shims here. These small shims are for setting your preload. Usually I'll throw the ones that came out of the old 
pinion onto the new pinion. I will put the yoke on. Remember this brace is pressed into the housing from this side and then it goes into the bearing. Now I will tighten the yoke down onto this until I have some resistance. I really don't care what the torque is at this point. I don't care what, if these are on tight or not. What I'm looking for is I want this all seated and snug enough so that I can check the contact pattern of the ring gear. Now, once I have my contact pattern correct here, I've got my correct shim in. I know I'm not gonna have to change this. Now, I will add and subtract shims out here. And again, remember, this race is pressed into the housing. This bearing goes in and you tighten this. Now, the spec for this is like 250 pounds, but just tighten it up to where it's tight. Once, once this outer bearing smashes up against these shims, it can't go any tighter. That's all the tighter it can go. So you don't want it to overload the bearing and put too much preload on and bind the bearing up. If you have too much bind, your bearings are gonna go out premature. If you're too loose, you could get play. So the preload shims go in here. Once your preload is set with a shim type like a Dana 60, you won't have to worry about it again with this set of gears. If you have a pinion seal go bad, you can replace the pinion seal, just tighten this down and retorque it, and you will not lose your pinion depth or your bearing preload. Now that we have got an understanding of our pinion depth and our shim goes here, I'm gonna throw a wrench right into that can of worms. Sometimes where this oil slinger is in this pinion, some differentials, and I have seen Dana's done this way too, use this distance between that pressed bearing and the head of the pinion to adjust pinion depth. That is another place you can put shims. I don't see it very often. It is far easier to adjust the depth with the back of the race. But be aware that if you're doing these yourself, you may have to pull this bearing and measure or change a shim out that goes between the head and the uh, inner pinion bearing. The other thing I'm gonna throw a little can of worms at is a lot of differentials like this one right here has a plus one on. And if you understand differential theory, you could set this new differential gears up mathematically in one shot without having to pull this back apart more than once. Now, in order to do that math, the first requirement is that the gears you are removing were set up correctly. In this instance, this Dana 60 was not. I could not turn these gears by hand. They were bound. Um, someone put these together wrong, and fortunately, they were never used. So, that plus one, what that really means is if this is set up correctly, I would need to remove one thousandth from this shim, which would move the pinion one thousandth that direction. If this had a minus one, I would add the shim. Now, is that backwards? Absolutely. But differential theory is different than practical differential uh, application. The center line of my ring gear would be over here and increasing the distance between the head of the pinion and that center line is increasing pinion depth. That's as far as I'm gonna go with it. I'm gonna show a picture of a book and a picture of an illustrated pinion depth drawing. If you really wanna get into the pinion depth and differential theory, I mean, this, this stuff's available uh, to read up on. Uh, there's a lot to it, a lot more than what people think. So there's the other can of worms I wanted to open. My recommendation, especially if you're new at this, ignore this number, start with your original shims, take a pattern check, and increase or decrease the shims 
based on is it too close to or too far away from your rain gear. Back to work. This is a great publication that was used in a lot of the trade schools for years if you want to do some reading up on pinion depth and differential theory. Get enough to where you can get the washer and the nut on. Okay, I've got the washer and the nut started. Four or five turns now. There's all kinds of slop in that. So next, I want to tighten this down. Pretty much zero play. Probably see I've got the ring gear so I can turn it a little bit. I have no side to side play in the carrier. I got a little bit of backlash. I'm really not concerned about if this is the correct backlash or not. I'm more concerned about it's close enough so I can get a pinion depth pattern. So now throw a little of this marking paint. You only need a thin coat on a couple, three teeth. You don't have to really goop it on. You want to see where the gears smear that marking paint off. I did snug the pinion up a little bit more than I normally would, just because I want, I'm, I'm doing A on the ground, but I also wanted to be able to not block the camera. So I'm gonna run this in. get a flashlight because I want to make sure I'm hitting the paint pattern. Yep. I should be better right there. You can see how it's pattern on the drive side is round at the top and straight cut on the bottom. That tells me my pinion is too close, and it's the same on the back side. Now, you'll notice I've got my coast side, the white pattern is on the outside or the heel side of the tooth, and on the uh, drive side, it is on the toe side of the tooth. That doesn't matter. That, that could be an acceptable pattern. It's just how the gears were machined. You just want to bring this out so it's not stuffed into the valley of the tooth. So at this point, I need to pull a couple of shims out, probably 10, 15 thousandths, and then we'll recheck it. I did want to reiterate, any of the acceptable patterns are fine. And if you look at these acceptable patterns, it's you're looking between your top and your bottom. 
of any of these. And these are just different machine uh, gears. And you can't really, if you want this one and you get this one, you have to change gears to get this one that was machined this way. Once you have an acceptable pattern, it's a good pattern. What you don't want are these hard lines on either the root or the crown. That, that's when you need to make a change. I removed a couple of shims. This one here's like a five and this one's uh, right at a 10. So I got 15 thousandths out of it. Let's see. You can see a huge difference in my drive side pattern. It's harder to see, but it's close. I've got, it's just a hair to the toe side. I think some of that may be because I've got very little backlash. Before I adjust this again and change the shim, I'm gonna get my backlash really close to spec. I adjusted my backlash a little bit. And again, I've got my pinion really over torqued. So there's some really good resistance on it, just for mostly the sake of the demonstration. Actually, you can see that fairly well from here. Nice round pattern. Um, I'm not, again, as concerned about it centered this direction as this direction. Uh, it is, it has got paint underneath and above the white marks. Uh, coast side looks really, really good. Got the carrier back out, unbolted the yoke. Now, the bearing is gonna probably stick to the mating surface inside. Usually they don't just push up. So I put the nut on down enough to where it'll find my ball peen hammer. Now you can use an air hammer with a bit on it, but most people don't have those at home, so I'm just doing it this way. Now I leave the nut on so it doesn't fall through. Now I'll go to the other side so I can catch the pinion and change the shim. Since I could over torque the pinion, I am adding a shim to create more space. Set the yoke on. And just hold the yoke. You just want to get enough to where you can get the washer and the nut on. Too tight, that combination's off, so pull her back apart. Ooh. Five thousandths. <laughs> Actually feels a little bit too loose. I don't even have to check that. I'm going to tighten it up just a hair. I think I've got the right combination figured out now. 
Now, I don't want to be too much thinner, just a few thousandths. And I don't have a really super thin shim. So what I'm going to have to do is find a different combination. I've got one that's a little bit thinner. So what I'll do is I'll trade one shim for that one. I've got the new bearings and new races in here. And it tells me I can do 17 to 30. All right, now that I've got my preload set, I've taken the yoke back off. I'm gonna put the back slinger in. Then I'm going to tap my seal in. And you've noticed I've been using the original nut on this pinion. Now that I'm doing the final assembly on the pinion, I will swap out the nut and the washer for the new lock nut and the new washer. And port. minimum of 17 inch pounds. Um, I would rather it be a little tighter, but I cannot get a combination of shims that will take me to 30. So I would rather it be right here than the other direction. So I'm going to call this good. Our seal's in. New nut, new washer, new bearings, new races shimmed correctly to the right depth. I will point out there's always some debate on whether your inch-pound reading is with the seal in or without the seal in. My answer to that, in my opinion, is both. If you are doing a crush sleeve, you need to have the seal in so that you don't have to remove the nut and screw up your new crush sleeve. On this style, where you're setting your preload with shims, I get the preload set and then put the seal in, and you're gonna gain an inch or two through the seal. We are now finished with the pinion side of it. We've got our depth set, we've got our preload set on the bearings, the seal, the slingers, the yoke, the new nut and washer, and it's all torqued. Now we're going to come back to the carrier. Now I'm just tightening those bolts with the impact. 35 pound torque. It's not full torque at this point. I'm just getting it to where I can check. I will say one thing that's handy about having all this truss and stuff up there is you can, uh, Set your dial indicator. I'm in 
try to zero the gauge, then you don't have to do math. It's a little tight. All right, you can see here I've got four thousandths of backlash. What that means, the spec is six to ten. So I need to remove a shim on this side and put a shim in this side and move the ring gear this direction. All right, I moved the one small shim over. I'm set back up here, zero, it's actually seven, but just under seven thousandths. I can slide this carrier in and out really easy and do want some preload on these bearings as well. Uh, I can't put a case spreader on this housing, which is the easy way because you can spread the case a little bit, slide the carrier in, release the case, and it squeezes the uh, shims down. So on this one, this is how I had to do it for years, and I do still do most of them that way. I'm going to take and I'm going to add a very, very thin shim to both sides to the point where I actually have to tap the raise to get the carrier slid in all the way. This is just a couple of thousandths is all. So I'm going to squish these between. The bigger shims. And one of the cool things on a Dana 60, especially if you're doing like air lockers and stuff, you can put big shims on the outside. The risk of that, unfortunately, is they can fold out. The shims are on the inside, they can't go anywhere. So I've added a few thousands. Now I'm gonna see if this goes in stiff and I'll do a backlash check. After that, we'll press both. Like I said, I wanted some preload on that, so it took a little bit of tapping, but uh, make sure it's straight and you're, you'll go right in. The last thing I'm going to do here before I press those side gear bearings permanently on, I'm just going to take my wrench and I'm going to run this back and forth and go around a couple of times and see if I feel anything that either binds uh, catches or hangs up. If it's smooth all the way around, there's nothing that feels like it's catching. Then I'm ready to pull this out. If something catches or feels weird, um, put the dial indicator on the side of your ring gear as such and run it around just to make sure that you don't have a warped ring gear. I leave the setup bearings on whichever side I'm not doing first because I don't want to mix up my shims. I also use an old race. and then a chunk of steel up here to guide it down. I don't like pressing it on the outer race or the cage. Uh, it can definitely do some damage to a cage if you're not careful. So shims are all there. Once you get down and you cannot see any daylight. Give your press an extra little pump to make sure it is fully seated. All right, 
flip her over and do the other side now. assembly make sure everything is torqued now I will double check Bring this over so I can do a close up. There we go. Between seven and eight thousandths, which is just fine. The bearings had just a little bit different tolerance than my setup bearings. So that's what made that up a little bit. Now that we know this is correct, let's do a final gear pattern. You see the drive side there and the coast side. Just about finished with this front differential. Um, I'm finished with the ring and pinion setup obviously. The only thing I have left to do is slide the axle shafts in, drive shaft, throw the cover on, fill it with fluid. I'm not going to cover how to do that in this video because that varies with every axle out there. Um, I will say I do recommend regular conventional gear oil over synthetic unless it's a specific manufacturer that requires the synthetic. I think it does a better job with uh, heat. Um, the other thing I would like to point out is you can order these online if you want uh, or download them off the internet, but these torque specification uh, pamphlets come with all the Yukon gears and I'm not plugging Yukon because I don't get paid by them. I really like their their tech sheets. Uh, that also has the pictures of correct gear patterns and they do the same thing I do. They uh, ring gear too close, ring gear too far away. Much easier than trying to understand all the differential theory because most of that stuff gets convoluted and backwards. Um, hopefully um, this has a lot of benefit for anyone doing not just a Dana 60, but any of the Dana differentials and related to differentials, like I mentioned earlier. Um, if you have any comments or questions, specifically questions, I'm happy to answer anything I can. Throw them in the comments. Uh, I read them as I can and answer what I can. Uh, with that, Next time I'm gonna do a 14 bolt under the same kind of um, format I did this one in. So if you like this one, you might like that one too. But either way, I appreciate you watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you next time.